Welcome to this week's lecture. Um, today we're talking about uh, John Rawls's paper on the duty of fair play and legal obligation. Um, this would be the last uh, reading in this unit. And next unit is a short one. We'll only have one reading and then class is over. So maybe you'll be happy, maybe you'll be sad. But in either case, um, we would have covered a lot of material by then. So I'll send an email out before class on Monday, um, just going over assignments and things you need to do. Um, and yeah, we'll have a short class on Monday. So let's get started. Um, in this paper, uh, John Rawls is interested in the question of how there can be a moral duty to obey an unjust law. But his broader question is the moral duty to obey the law at all. So whether the law is just or unjust. And as you will have already known, for Rawls, there is a duty to obey the law. There's a duty to obey unjust laws. And the duty is attributable to a more general duty of fair play or of fairness. Now, before I get into the argument, I just want to say a couple introductory remarks about uh, this this paper uh, and John Rawls himself. The paper was written in 1964, I believe, and of course that was a time during uh, a time of civil unrest. Now, a major question in society at, at large was whether there is a moral obligation to obey an unjust law. So you might think of Martin Luther King um, and Malcolm X um, taking different positions on this issue. But in any case, uh, Rawls approaches this question uh, that was very important in society, and he's putting it in a more general context of uh, the philosophical tradition of explaining a moral obligation to obey the law. Another interesting point about this paper is that this paper considers issues surrounding the nature of a legal order, the nature of a constitution, and the and the nature of a democratic constitution. Uh, from the 50s onward, there was a renewed interest in how legal orders work. And this renewed interest stemmed from uh, what had happened in World, World War II with the Nazis. Um, the big problem was, well, the Nazis had a constitution and they were able to use the constitution to do all kinds of terrible things. So, you know, how could a constitution do this? And could other constitutions do what Nazis did? So, again, Rawls is bringing up this this issue about the nature of a legal order um, in convention with the thinking at that time. So let's move back uh, to Rawls's argument in this paper. So what Rawls wants to do is show that the moral obligation to obey the law is grounded in a moral duty of fairness. Now the way Rawls is going to do that is he's going to show that there's a moral duty to obey unjust laws. And the idea is if Rawls can show that there's a moral duty to obey unjust laws and that duty is grounded in fairness, well, surely there's a duty to obey just laws and presumably that duty is also grounded in considerations of fairness. So in order to make the bigger point that we have a moral duty to obey the law because of fairness, Rawls is going to make the smaller point uh, that we have a duty to obey unjust laws. There's a sense in which it's a smaller point because unjust laws are fewer, you would hope, uh, than the amount of just laws that there are. But in another sense, it's a stronger point. It's easier to think we have a duty to obey just laws, but it's harder to think that we have a duty to obey unjust laws. If Rawls can make the harder point, then he can definitely make the easier point. So that's the way the argument works. Now, Rawls says there are two reasons, uh, or I'm sorry, 
Rawls's argument employs two strategies to show there's a moral obligation to obey the law grounded in fairness. The first strategy is the one I mentioned, that we have a duty to obey unjust laws. The second strategy is that we have a duty to obey the law even when obeying the law would produce less good than disobeying the law. So, for example, maybe um, housing illegal immigrants. Um, assume that you know laws preventing this uh, are just laws. Uh, maybe it would be better overall for society if people were allowed to house illegal immigrants. But Rawls says, well, the right thing to do is not to do what's best for society, but to do what your legal order demands of you. That's the second way Rawls can argue for the moral obligation to obey the law. Now, in this paper, Rawls doesn't really give an argument for that way, um, so I'm not really going to discuss it. But I will mention that even though Rawls outlines that strategy, he makes good on his promise to give that argument uh, in his later works. So another point about John Rawls, if you take any other philosophy class um, and study moral political philosophy, you will definitely read John Rawls because John Rawls is the single most influential political philosopher and perhaps moral philosopher of the past century. Um, and his most famous work is called A Theory of Justice. And in that big giant book, he argues that justice is grounded in fairness. So this paper was written before that book, and in a way, it's kind of the beginnings of the idea that all of justice is grounded in considerations of fairness. All right, so let's um, get to it. So first, let's start with the idea or... Um, the nature of a legal order or a constitutional procedure. So Rawls tells us that a legal order is a system of rules and it's a system of rules at the foundation of society and this system of rules regulates everybody's substantial interests. So their interest in being protected from crimes, uh, their interest in making contracts and all the other kinds of things that are really important like that. Now, another aspect of the legal order is that it enforces its rules through a monopoly of course of powers. So only the state is allowed to use force in society. Um, and the kind of legal order that Rawls is concerned about is a democratic legal order. So it's not just any legal order like maybe Nazi legal orders, but it's one where the Constitution gives everybody an equal standing before the law. The rule of law is in effect. And there's not one rule for some people and a different rule for other people. Um, the rules are applied consistently and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of thing Rawls means by a legal order or a constitution or a constitutional procedure. So the question how can a citizen be moral ob morally obligated to obey an unjust law? So to answer this question, Rawls really gives two kinds of arguments. He says, first, we realize there's a problem when a citizen has to obey an unjust law. But the kind of problem that's at the forefront is a moral problem. It seems morally wrong for a citizen to obey an unjust law. But there's a different kind of problem when a citizen obeys an unjust law. Uh, there's a logical problem, right? There's a seemingly logical paradox with citizens in a democracy uh, obeying an unjust law. So what Rawls does is he first addresses this logical problem, and then he goes to address the moral problem. Now, it might be interesting just to solve the logical problem you know on its own merits right it's an interesting thing but i think the reason why rawls brings up the logical problem first is that when he solves the logical problem it tells you something very important that you're going to need to solve the moral problem so let's start with the logical problem of a democratic legal order so rawls says 
some people think there's a paradox uh, for citizens living in a democracy. So here's the paradox. I vote for law A because I think law A should be enacted, right? But suppose that law B gets the majority vote. Now, as a democratic citizen um, who follows the Constitution, I believe the majority vote should be enacted uh, because I believe I should, you know, we should follow the Constitution. However, if I believe uh, that A is the best policy, well, I also believe that A should be enacted. Here's the problem. As a democratic citizen, when I find myself in this case, I believe that A should be enacted and I believe that B should be enacted. How can I believe that both A and B should be enacted if we assume that A and B are contrary laws or laws that can't be enacted at the same time? So the paradox is, how can it be in a democracy that one person can believe a law should be enacted and at the same time should not be enacted? So Raw says, the way to solve this paradox is to distinguish between two questions. The first question is, which policy A or B is the best policy? And the second question is, which policy A or B should be enacted? And Rawls says, the way to think about this is to say that when a citizen votes for policy A, they're tr answering the question of which policy is the best policy. But just because I think A is the best policy, that doesn't mean I think A should be enacted. Um, I might think that B should be enacted because B follows the constitution, constitutional procedure of getting a majority vote. So when B gets a majority vote, I don't think that B is the best policy, but I think B answers the second question, which policy should be enacted. So Rawls says there, there really is no paradox in voting for A, but thinking that B should be enacted. When I vote for A, I answer one question, and when I think B should be enacted, uh, I'm thinking about an answer to a different question. So the main idea here is that a constitutional procedure tells you how to act. A constitutional procedure doesn't tell you which law to think is best. That's how constitutions work. So this seems to solve the logical problem uh, that was raised by citizens in a democratic society, but now we face the moral problem. Suppose, right, a citizen votes for A, but B gets the majority, and so the citizen thinks that B should be enacted. But suppose that the citizen doesn't think that B is not merely not the best law, but the citizen thinks that B is an unjust law. Now, if the citizen wants to follow the constitutional procedure, the citizen should believe that B should be enacted. But if that's right, then we can ask this moral question. How is it morally justified that a citizen should follow a constitution that will have them act in a way that they believe is unjust? How can we follow a constitution that will give us unjust laws? This is the moral problem. So to answer the moral problem, um, Rawls focuses on the nature of a legal order or a constitutional procedure. And there are two features he says that work to justify our obeying an unjust law. So the first feature of a legal order or the nature of a legal order is that even if you have a legal order that's perfectly just, that order will in inevitably produce unjust laws. And the second feature of the legal order is that the principle of fair play applies to those who are bound to legal orders. And so Rawls's argument is going to try to show that from these two assumptions, um, citizens may be morally required to obey unjust laws. So let's look at the first assumption. So the moral justification for following a constitution that will make unjust laws begins with the fact that People will always disagree. Uh, disagree about what laws there should be, disagree about how to live their lives, and disagree about what morality and justice requires of us. So, you know, imagine something like, you know, a state of nature. We have to set up 
a procedure for making laws uh, to avoid anarchy, right? If we don't set up a legal order, it's going to be chaos. Now, when we're deciding what kind of order to establish, we know that everybody's going to disagree, and we know that everybody's going to disagree because they want to tailor the legal order to make laws that favor them. Everybody wants to be a dictator. That's the first reason why everybody's going to disagree. Now, if everybody realizes that everybody wants to be a dictator, we're, we can all realize that we're not going to get anywhere. So we have to find some other point to agree on. Now, everybody might agree that we should make a just constitution or a just way for making laws. And everybody might agree, well, if we're going to make a just way to make laws, then nobody can be a dictator. So we all come to a point of agreement, and that's fine. But does this get rid of all the important disagreements? Um, and the answer is no. Because a constitutional procedure, uh, according to Rawls, is just a way to make laws. So you can imagine like the procedure is a box, um, and on one side of the box, all the information comes in, let's say votes, or let's say data, or let's say what people think is just, right? We all, It all gets shoved in. And then in that box of the Constitution, it rearranges it all and does algorithmic work, and then it spits out perfectly defined laws that everybody must obey. So the procedure is just a way for, for taking inputs and giving outputs, and the outputs are laws that are being to be obeyed. Now, everybody might agree that the procedure should be just, but it's not going to get rid of all the disagreements because the laws that will come out that everybody has to obey, um, people are going to disagree whether those laws are just or unjust. That is, sometimes a law will be produced that some people think is just and other people think is unjust. And sometimes, um, a law will be produced that is just unjust, and everybody thinks so. And Rawl says this is just a fact about constitutions. The fact is that constitutions can't make perfectly just laws all the time. Even the best, most just constitution is still going to give you unjust laws, and that's just an unfortunate fact of life. So... The que so the, our question was, if we all agree on a perfectly just constitutional procedure, does that get rid of disagreements? And the answer is no. No, because it's sometime gonna sp the procedure is sometimes going to spit out laws that some people are going to think are unjust while others think are just. But we must have a constitutional procedure. We cannot get rid of it. Uh, and the constitutional procedure must be just because we don't want dictatorship. So... Given the fact that we need a just constitution and given the fact that there will always be disagreements on whether a law is just or unjust, it follows that sometimes persons are going to have to obey laws that are unjust. So now we get to the second premise. Um, if, we, if we have... And we can start with this question. If we have to obey laws that we think are unjust, how can we make sense of this morally? How can morality allow us to obey laws that, by our own lights, are unjust? Well, Rawls says here, this is where the principle of fair play comes in. So if we're all bound to a just constitution and we all agree or we know that a just constitution will sometimes spit out unjust laws then we all know that we're each going to have to take turns uh, in obeying a law that we don't think is just but Rawls says look if we all take turns whenever this happens we can understand there's a kind of fairness relation going on between us sometimes there's a law that's unjust um, and I have to obey it if we want to preserve, you know, the legal order and make sure it works good. But I know in the future, sometimes there's going to be a law that I think is just and you think it's unjust. 
but you should obey that law just in the same way I obeyed an unjust law so we can make sure the legal order is working fine. But notice here, Rawls's argument doesn't really depend on our obeying unjust laws so the legal order keeps working. Because suppose there's a law that says, you know, you can't smoke marijuana. And suppose somebody goes into their basement and they smoke marijuana. Now here, and let's say they smoke marijuana because they think the law is unjust. Let's say they believe that. Now here, if somebody breaks the law, they're not destroying the legal order, right? They're just in their basement. And there's not really any effect on what's going on. But Rawls says, well, they should obey a law that they believe is unjust, not because it destroys the legal order, but because it's only fair. And here, Rawls brings in the idea of uh, cooperative schemes. So a cooperative scheme is a scheme that aims to benefit everybody who participates in it, but it must benefit everybody when most people pay the cost. So Rawl says, if I'm part of this scheme and most people pay the cost and then everybody receives the benefit, Rawl says, I'm morally bound by considerations of fairness to pay my cost um, even though I can just get the benefits without paying the cost. So we talked about this um, in the lecture on Dagger and so you may want to go back to that handout and consider the moral obligation of fair play or the notes that I gave there. But again, the idea is the rule of or the law provides peace in society. I enjoy that peace as long as I'm in society. But the peace only comes if every when everybody obeys the law. But if everybody's doing their part in obeying the law, why should I be given a chance to cheat or be given a chance to break the law? Um, when nobody else, um, you know, is doing that. Why should I get the advantages of breaking the law when everybody is paying the cost of not breaking the law? So Rawls says, fairness requires that I obey even when I can benefit um, from not obeying. And Rawls says, here, that's how fairness applies to cooperative schemes. And Rawls says, look, the legal order is just this kind of cooperative scheme. So we can think about what happens when a law comes out that I think is unjust. If when a law comes out that you think is unjust and you obey it anyway, when the time comes for me to take my turn and an obey, obey an unjust law, it's only fair that I do that because you paid a cost and it would be wrong for me to not obey uh, and get the benefit of doing what I think is just when you didn't do the same. So the main idea here is when we enjoy the benefits of everybody obeying the laws, whether they're just or, or unjust, uh, we should obey the laws of the Constitution, even when we disagree. So that's Rawls's argument for the obligation to obey unjust laws in a democratic society. And it's his argument that says Considerations of fairness ground this duty. And remember, as I said in the beginning, if Rawls can show that we have a duty to obey unjust laws by considerations of fairness, well then it's he's basically already made the case to obey just laws by the principle of fairness. Uh, the same idea applies. Now I just want to make some final notes to end this lecture. And and say that here, the duty of fair play, uh, Rawls means for there to be consent, a kind of consent anyway. Now the consent is not like Hobbes, because remember for Hobbes, a conqueror can coerce consent and that consent uh, can morally bind you. The consent that Rawls has here is more like Locke's tacit consent. So Rawls says, the way we're part of cooperative schemes and the way we are bound by the principle of fair play is when we accept the benefits of that scheme and in, continue to intend to do so. But notice here on Rawls's view, when we talk about 
the benefits of the rule of law. Well, the benefit of the rule of law is peace. And as long as I'm in society, I can't help but enjoy that benefit. There's no way to avoid the benefits of enjoying peace. So for Rawls, everybody in society is bound by this duty of fair play. Maybe Locke has a similar idea here, but Rawls is a little bit more explicit on how that works. And the last point here is that, well, as common sense would dictate, there are limits to the duty of fair play. That is, we don't, it's not all the time that there's an unjust law, we have to obey it. So Rawls says, for example, um, if there are laws that prevent people from freely practicing their religion, or if there are laws that um, continually and systematically uh, take advantage of one group like a minority. Uh, Rawls says there the injustice might be stronger uh, than the duty of fair play. So, so whenever there's an unjust law, we do have a moral obligation to obey it from considerations of fairness. But when there's an unjust law, we have to realize that we also have a duty to do to follow justice. And the question is, well, which duty is stronger? Is it the duty to obey the unjust law by considerations of fairness? Or is the duty to follow justice uh, stronger than the duty of fairness? Now, Rawls's argument says sometimes the duty to fairness is greater than the duty to follow justice. But other times, if a law is really unjust, well, the duty to follow justice can outweigh the duty to fairness or the duty to obey because of fairness. So, you know, it's always an open question for each case. But just because it's an open question doesn't mean that there's not a duty of fair play. So for Rawls, you know, there always is this duty as long as you have a legal order that everybody is cooperating and enjoying the benefits in. But the duty of fair play does have limits, and Rawls is um, keen to mention those. So that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you were able to follow. Um, and I'll send, again, I'll send out an email with uh, other important things I need to tell you. So have a good weekend.